Hi, this is Dr. Lauren Lownan from the Biology Department, and I want to talk to you a little bit about gram-positive and gram-negative bacterial cells. Shown here is a cartoon of just a typical bacterial or prokaryotic cell. What I want to focus on is the cell wall structure, and the cell wall structure here is shown in kind of an intermediate blue color. Let's think about how the cell walls of bacteria are organized and what their function is. The purpose of the cell wall is to protect cells from water stress, otherwise known as osmotic stress. In other words, the cell wall is what protects the cell from bursting. Typically when the salty cell, the interior of a, of a cell is fairly salty, is found in a more watery environment. And those are conditions that favor the movement of water by osmosis into the cell. And if that is unchecked, the cell will burst. Luckily, the cell wall is there in all bacterial cells to prevent this from happening. The cell is located outside of the cell membrane, and its composition in bacteria includes a very rigid structural molecule called peptidoglycan, and it's spelled here. And this is a molecule that combines carbohydrates and amino acids. It's extremely rigid, and it is only synthesized by organisms that belong to the domain bacteria. Now, that's a little bit about the basic structure and function of the cell wall. Now, within the category of cell wall, there are some cat further ways to think about and differentiate one bacterial cell from another. Why do you want to care about this, or why do people care about this? For one thing, there's a medical relevance to this topic. A lot of antibiotics, such as penicillin, will kill bacteria by destroying their cell wall. Once their cell wall is destroyed, they lice or burst from water stress. So knowing what kind of bacterium is infecting a patient in the case of, uh, of someone who is ill with a bacterial infection will provide the physician with the information that they need to treat the patient using the appropriate antibiotic. Another reason that you might want to know the cell wall status or category of a bacterium is that it is useful to know that information so that you can identify the bacterium. And again, that'll help a physician choose the right antibiotics to kill it, and it'll help just a regular old microbiologist study and better understand the organism. There are essentially four categories of bacteria when you divide them according to their cell walls. They can be gram-positive, gram-negative, gram-intermediate, which is also called acid-fast, or very few of them are actually cell wall free or cell wall less. And we're not going to focus on categories 3 or 4 today. We're going to focus on categories 1 and 2. The images shown here depict a cross section um, and a cellular view of a gram positive on the left and a gram negative on the right bacterium. And the image shown here in the middle is a gram stain, and you've done the gram stain in lab at this point, and the gram stain shows you the status of a bacterial cell. The pinkish ones are gram-negative, for example, the E. coli you looked at the other day, and the purple ones are gram-positive. How do these look different? Well, gram-positives are really straightforward. They have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan, and then they have a little space, and then they have the cytoplasmic membrane. So this is the outside of the cell, this is the inside of the cell. The gram negatives have a really thin layer of peptidoglycan, and there's a space on either side, which is called the periplasmic space, and then they have this really cool structure called the outer membrane. The outer membrane has another name. It's often called the endotoxin, and it's sometimes called the LPS layer. It's so important that people study this a lot, and so it's acquired a lot of different names over the years. The name endotoxin should suggest something to you because it's got the word toxin in it. And that should tell you that in many gram-negative pathogens, what actually makes you sick is the endotoxin layer on the outside of the bacterium. Here is the cytoplasmic membrane. So this is the inside, and this is the outside of that bacterium. And these show us like cross sections that are depicting where the cell wall is. Here it is in yellow, and here it is over here in kind of a pinky rust color. 
Maybe an easier way to draw a gram-positive versus a gram-negative cell wall in a bacterium is to show it with cross-sections as in this figure. So up here we have a gram-positive organism, cell wall cross-section, and down here we have a gram-negative cross-section. So in our gram-positive, this would be the outside of the cell, this would be the inside of the cell, the rest of it's not drawn, but you know it would continue like this, okay? Here is the peptidoglycan layer, and there is the plasma membrane. Gram-positives don't have an endotoxin or an outer membrane layer. Here in this gram-negative, this is the inside of the cell, this is the outside of the cell. The rest of this would, of course, continue going around. Here is the peptidoglycan layer, shown in this dark color. The space referred to as the paraplasmic space. A lot of texts will show you that this is the paraplasmic space, too. This sort of rust-colored object is the outer membrane, also known as the endotoxin. Okay, and here is the plasma membrane, which is on the inside. The cell wall always lies on the, in, uh, on the outside of the cytoplasmic or cellular membrane. All right, now in class, you did a gram stain on two bacteria. You did a gram stain on gram-negative E. coli and a gram stain on gram-positive Bacillus cereus. And um, I included this figure in your lab handout, but let's just review it now that you've actually done the technique, that you've actually done the, this kind of experiment. So what's happening? Let's think about it from the gram-negative perspective first. You, you heat fix your sample. That's this step here, right? And then you stain it in two steps, crystal violet and Graham's iodine, okay? And this creates a thick, dark color, which is purplish blue in nature. Next, you use the decolorizer, and you get cells that have no stain because the slightly less rigid cell wall of a gram-negative bacteria will break when you put decolorizer on it, and all of the stain will pour out of the cell and essentially slough off it. So that leaves these pale, unstained cells if this is a gram-negative. And then the counter stain, which is a beautiful red color, it's a, a chemical called safranin, will be soaked up by these colorless gram-negatives and it'll look reddish-pink. Okay, And that's how a gram-negative um, cell should stain. Now the gram-positive, in contrast, you heat fix it, attaching it to the slide, you stain it with crystal violet and Graham's iodine, and that makes that thick, dark stain. Okay? You use decolorizer, but because these cells have that really big, thick, rigid layer of peptidoglycan, they hold onto the dark stain. So that when you counter stain, you're putting red over purple. And if you think back to your watercolor days or your earlier art days, you'll know that if you put a layer of red over top of purple, you're not really going to see the red, you're still going to see the purple. And that's why we see this dark purpley blue color in a correctly done gram-positive stain. So that's all I have to say about the difference between gram-negatives and gram-positives. Have a great rest of the day.